So today we welcome you to the second um, conversation with Linda Okazaki from Port Townsend. I think a lot of you know her personally. And um, Dr. Um, Lisa for Louis Wood is also here and they've been working together for quite a while to further um, dive into the meaning of a lot of, of um, Linda's paintings. It's been a journey. Uh, planning a retrospective takes some time. We've been working for over a year in some detail. And um, Linda has, um, has shared discoveries in her work along the way. And it's been really exciting. This is one of the more complicated um, retrospectives I've been involved in, partly because of the complexity of Linda's life, um, how um, narrative her work is, and all the meaning and visual vocabulary in it. And I just want to say it's a real thrill to have worked with you on this. The exhibition will be extended. We originally, in the um, advertising, said it would be up and through the 4th of February, but we are going to extend it through the 25th of February. And we're right now completing a book that will also be available. And um, there is um, there are some items in the store for sale right now, but the book that we'll be publishing will be available um, in the coming weeks. We will have a reception following in Linda's exhibition upstairs, and I invite you all to stay and enjoy some food and drink and further conversation. So um, I would want to turn this over to the two of you and to kick that off. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. That's great. So this has been quite a journey. And I asked you earlier to, um, if you could put it into one or two words, what we've been doing together, what would you call it? I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Authentic investigation is what it is at this moment, but it was something, something slightly different a half hour ago. And everything changes, right? And, <laughs> and I said creative spelunking. Oh. <laughs> um, because we've really uh, delved into a lot of nooks and crannies of the paintings and talking about all the things we might explore in this conversation today. And um, pages of notes, emails, more conversation, texting, um, getting together and pouring over the notes. And um, what we finally settled on over this eight month period of talking is to really focus in more narrowly on 12 images um, and the ballast of which have to do with your mother's death. Yes. And we get into that pretty quickly today. Um, and we'll try to make some good transitional statements as we are doing that. But I think that we want to spend time looking at the images and also for you especially to tell the narrative from your perspective. Yes, yeah, so over uh, from 1953 to the present. So it is a span of time. And I'm just delighted to see all of you in the audience, friends and family, and others that I hope to have a chance to uh, talk with uh, upstairs, and to thank Greg and Dasha, especially for their dedicated effort this last year. When I first got a call from Greg and Amy Sawyer, and they suggested that they were considering me for a retrospective exhibit honoring the first decade of FEMA being open and free to the public. I was shocked and astounded. I, I had, it just did not cross my mind at any time. And so I listened to what they had to say and they explained to me the process and I thought, well, Linda, you're 76 years old, and this is the best opportunity that's ever <laughs> been ever come to my way. So I better figure out how to make it happen one way or another. 
And uh, they said, well, do you have a suggested working title? And I said, well, uh, thinking of what Alan Maskin had suggested after my talk at Smith and Valley Gallery back in 2019. I said, how about incomplete sentence? <laughs> <laughs> and I, I thought, oh, that's perfect. But then uh, about eight months ago, uh, Lisa uh, discovered that I was really struggling to put these piles of papers that stretch the length of about a 12-foot table on the west side of my studio. And um, I couldn't really tell what they were exactly. And she said, well, you know what you could do is you could begin to put them into categories and pile them up that way. And then we could put them into small boxes. And I did that. And I ended up with some of those categories that you'll see upstairs, personal narrative, domesticity, dream logic, earth, air, fire, water, sort of uh, theater and song. And I, I began to get those in boxes. So they were still hanging out without a place to be. And that went into correspondence and some other files. And so then she said, well, now you can take those and kind of put those together into groupings. And so I did that. And then I had, uh, instead of just uh, bales of hay, they looked like loaves of bread. <laughs> and it, it, it seemed like, uh, it was kind of like, cleaning off your desktop that had been in disarray for 50 years, and it had piled up terribly. And so I began to get, I was like, oh, oh, I, I have a system here. And so I moved into the light. I had a new title suddenly. <laughs> and so that's where we began about more than eight months ago. And uh, we're here today, and it's just been such a gift to work with you and to have these conversations and uh, an editor, in a sense, and uh, a voice to move me along to that next step. So thank you all. <laughs> with that, we're going to start looking at some of the paintings that we've selected for today. And I have so many things to say, I'm not going to say anything to start with. And just turn it to you to tell us, when you look at this now and when you've been looking at it the last few days and writing notes, what, what is most important? Well, it is the size and proportion of, a, of the New Yorker. <laughs> Cover. <laughs> Cover. I keep doing that, hoping one day I might get lucky. <laughs> and uh, this seemed the perfect, the perfect thing because uh, now they animate their illustrations, and the the boats could circle around my feet in that shallow water, and and it was upbeat, and it was from the fifties. That many of us our age. Uh, recognize the tabletop and that kind of linoleum that uh, was sort of earth uh, grounding. Uh, it, uh, it reminded me of the landscape flying over the, the flat part of uh, the United States from an airplane. Or, um, and then the water, yes, it was there, sort of dreamlike, but it was shallow, like maybe something spilled on the floor. And so she's tippy-toe looking up, uh, trying to see what was up above. And the jeans was really typical because I was such a tomboy. I much preferred jeans to fancy dresses. And so that fit. And, um, and the table, it was so inviting. My mother was such a grand cook. I would go to the cafe, the, the Pine Cafe, where she worked. and. Uh, get a bowl of her clam chowder whenever I could. It was so tasty, and I, I still use that recipe today. And she also was known for her spaghetti that was a um, 
Angelo Pellegrini recipe. And um, we still use that recipe for family reunion. It's very good. And um, so there was that warmth uh, that I was bringing to mind as I was trying to uh, do this, this image. And it also ended up then later being used for uh, the poster image for the uh, Port Townsend Women, Women's Film Festival. Uh, Women in Film, I think it was called back in 2015 or 14 or something uh, uh, close to that. And uh, at that time, in fact, uh, Terry Tennyson, a great graphic designer, he did make the boats go around uh, the feet with his uh, clever uh, graphic design elements. And then he had those seagulls in town go, or however that sound that they make, you know, and it was very loud and everybody laughed. So it was the perfect, he fulfilled my dream of uh, that imagined thing, which was nice. But there was a sad element to this too, in that uh, it was just imaginary looking back and trying to add warmth uh, to a situation that had already turned uh, tragic. and. Um, and I lost my mother as a six-year-old. And sometimes I would work with these images in order to recall a memory loss from that period of time from one to six or uh, up to six years old because I, I didn't have any, hardly any recall of that. And um, also the illustration kind of thing, I realized that I decided I wanted to be an artist when I was about five years old and saw Pinocchio for the first time. And when I saw Pinocchio and Monstro, wasn't that his name, come up and grab Pinocchio and then inside the mouth of the whale, I thought, oh, I want to learn how to do that. That is really something else. And so at that, I mean, that was uh, just, yes, I want to be an artist and I, I kind of wanted to, um, learn more about that, even at that age. But I saw the Pinocchio uh, exhibit at MoMA last year. Oh, it was so marvelous to see all those mockettes to, style, to uh, scale and the, the color boards to create different um, emotional feelings for different scenes and the big board of all the people involved in creating this. And I was just enamored with uh, this rendition of Pinocchio that was quite different, considerably different from uh, the Disney rendition, although I appreciated both. And what it also reminded me of was that that scene when um, Pinocchio's dad says, I love you just as you are. Be exactly as you are. And all of a sudden, Pinocchio came alive. And I thought, if I can move to a place where I can completely accept myself exactly as I am, that I could be like Pinocchio coming alive. And what I shared with Pinocchio was that he had to be careful about who he trusted. And I needed to do that early in my life, too, because everyone wanted to give me advice. And some of it was good, and some of it not. So I needed to learn early on who I could trust, because the loss of the mother is the loss of unconditional love. And so you have to fortify yourself. So we'll move, the next one is a bit difficult. We're going to move into the death of the mother, the mother wound for the next two. And we'll discuss that. And then we'll move in to the process of discovery. They are hard to look at. And, but they're, they're crucial to the story, and I was not going to exhibit them 
But it's true, according to Greg's uh, insight, that the more that I brought it into my complete story, uh, the more that, uh, well, like Edward Mook said about his work, that his life was filled with agony and illness. But he owed so much of his art to that that he probably would not change anything in his life. And so at this time, I suppose that it too has fed my creative spirit in all these ways that I'll talk about, and some of them quite technical, and also having to do with medicine, the healing of trauma and, uh, and injury, both from war or private tragedy or whatever. What is the possible trajectory? And so we'll address some of that. So here we have Shot in the Dark uh, from 1977. Um, I learned drawing and printmaking from Robert Ecker, uh, who was uh, just so fantastic. He's no longer uh, with us, but if you ever uh, look at his work, you'll see his influences, and he taught me so much. And he had such a kind, understanding, uh, generosity that I loved being his student and friend uh, throughout his life. Uh, he wrote me uh, until his death uh, uh, fairly recently. And so we had a correspondence that was meaningful to me, his philosophical approach to art and, and that sort of thing. So here we have a graphite drawing. And um, you can see that I was influenced by Ecker, yes, but also people like Escher, and, and where it was always a good study between light and dark, uh, compositional study, and so I made use of, of that knowledge of composition. But here, the story, uh, I was told that the murderer uh, probably shot my mother from hiding in the closet. But if you look at the hand, it's just a, a, a small hand, like a, like a, a girl, and the, the gun is heavy, and the two shots through the canvas were sort of my way of saying it may be a source, this tragedy may be a source of my creative imagination. And the one shot on the bed was her death, and then the robe is, the mother was removed, and the patterning on the wall, um, I discovered, was not so far away from the curvilinear shapes uh, that I discovered late, later. And then some of the things that appear in these kinds of, of pictures, I did have a bed like that that was uh, in the family, and I had the easel, and uh, that little stool is still in my daughter's house, and so I would use references of, of things that I had in order to do the sketching. And uh, so this was one of my first uh, uh, attempts to develop a personal iconography, uh, probably with permission of artists such as Leonora Carrington or other surrealists or even uh, Frida Kahlo. How do we tell our story in a way that uh, has uh, authenticity to it, but still artistry. I asked you earlier if it was it made a difference to be doing this first attempt using graphite rather than color. And yes, I think I had to step through the complexity that it was hard for me and um, and uh, other people too. It seemed like it was uh, a drawing of courage. Mm -hmm to be able to put that on the paper or to exhibit it and say, because usually there's a stigma associated with such things, and certainly family and uh, friends or my brother, you know, you just want to be quiet about this so that the trauma isn't, um, well, it could even be thought of as being uh, self-indulgent, I suppose. 
Mm -hmm. But I always felt that weight, and then I didn't have the unconditional love. So I wanted to find a place where I felt stronger, where I could move through it mm -hmm. without being uh, having this hidden part. So it sounds like you were aware that you were using the artwork to work through the emotions of the traumatic event or the memories that had been given to you through other people's reports of what happened. Oh, yeah, I was working at uh, Sears catalog desk because they hired me because I had such good handwriting. And, uh, and I was patient and detailed-oriented. I did just fine. But everything I earned went to my psychiatrist. And my family let me live there with them for free and fed me. But he never, ever talked to me. He never <laughs> said a word. Yeah. I sat down and talked for an hour. And then I went away, and he gave me a, prescri a prescription of, of stuff that didn't work very well for me. It just meant I couldn't drive. So I had to somebody, I had to have my aunt drive me to work and pick me up. That wasn't very convenient. And so after that, I thought, why don't you just study Freud and Jung <laughs> and Alice Miller and um, C.S. Lewis and um, uh, other people of that sort, or, or Jung's hysterical woman, or, you know, <laughs> these other people, and develop some language around that. At least you could talk to yourself. And, and that may be one of the great benefits of therapy. <laughs> um, you have talked to me about uh, what people in the family and community were saying and some of the stigma around your mother's death. And I wonder if this is a good point to talk about some of that. Um, well, um, I, it was important for me to... Uh, We'll see in the next uh, pictures that uh, by 2015, I still carried the shadow when we got around to this time of year where the darkening of the days and we're moving into the holidays. And how do you make it an upbeat, joyous, wonderful time? I wanted to provide that for my family and my children and not carry a weight. of. I wanted them to feel um, embraced and joyful and all of those things. But uh, people are uh, vulnerable at this time of year. And um, through not having enough resources or trauma or whatever it might be, and certainly for uh, the neighborhood at that time, uh, he would stand uh, less than two blocks away at a pay phone and call over and over and over again. And it was a party line. You know, so everybody on that party line was annoyed. They knew who he was. Um, um, and so, yes, that was a very difficult... No wonder people wanted to push it aside. Mm -hmm. and, um, and for us, we had already been traumatized as small children. I was six and my brother nine. So, of course, once the tragedy had happened, you wanted to be rid of it as soon as possible and move on to whatever was the next, the next chapter. So one of the things we'll see as we go through the next two pictures before we come back to this scene is some of the ways that you transformed this particular drawing and added more possible interpretations to it and also some of the leitmotifs from this drawing that appear in other paintings. Yes. Let's take a look. So here we have Memory Fades uh, uh, the next year, and so you still see the easel and the canvas, but now it has uh, pictographic drawings from ancient art, uh, I've forgotten the reference at this point, but it was from something that I connected to visually. And I probably have a reference slide, but I didn't take the time to uh, find it. And then the gun and the hand is gone from the drapery. And the, the, the cube and the little round stick 
are an indication that I had a son who was four years old. And the robe, it doesn't feel as languished as the one in Shot in the Dark. It feels almost like it could get up and something could happen. And then the uh, kingfisher is standing like a sentinel guard. And he, he makes an appearance a few times, transformed into the Fisher King. And then the inside and outside are commingled uh, to uh, create this. Maybe it's to make the Sentinel Guard a little more in both places. And the door ajar leads us into the next painting that we'll look at. So I want to make a, a comment just hearing you talk about that, because the term liminality is used to describe your paintings, that state between one state and another that feels more fixed or firm or defined. And it seems like this is the liminal painting. Yes, yes. And then the liminality of the Fisher King between the interior and exterior, yes. the conscious and unconscious. Oh, yes, I didn't think of it that way, but that's, I'm so glad you brought that up. I didn't until just now. <laughs> that's true, that's true. <laughs> Real time, okay. Uh -huh. So um, can you say something about your return to the scene you know, in this, is in this form as a painting, but going back to the images, going back to the scene periodically um, to check in with yourself. Yes, usually it was a recurrent at this time of year. And it was a way to see, have you made progress? Is this different in the way that it feels, mm -hmm. both to you and perhaps to the viewer? Does it have a different... Uh, what is the feel? Mm -hmm. And so I think that that was usually the check. What is the feel? Mm -hmm. What's being communicated? Is that kind of the words you would use? Or that yeah, word? yeah, mm -hmm. I think so. It had to do with the heart. Mm -hmm. Oops, I patted myself on my <laughs> mm -hmm. um, Do you remember what inspired you to do this painting? Was it that kind of checking in, or was it you wanted to come back and transform it and, and see what that felt like? Or Well, I had been working on uh, Wolfgang Color Theory uh, from 71 to 75. Uh, that was uh, Chromatic Lessons was really what he called it uh, in the uh, German. And um, there were 390 experiments, and I was going to write my thesis on it, but um, it was kind of hard. Um, it was when Napoleon was on his horse and galloping around, and I know he was doing things, but I'm not sure what. And uh, Goethe was writing this uh, theory of color, only it was never a theory because it was subjective. It was uh, the artist paying attention to how they responded to color from the retina in their body. Uh, what was the emotional response? And to him, he felt that artists were science in action. Mm -hmm. And he thought that this was the best work he had ever done. And I thought that he was known as being a pretty smart guy. So I thought, well, this is, I found it in the old stacks of Holland Library. And so I was always carrying these things out. And I asked Bob Helm and Galen Hansen if I could write a theory on this. And they said, well, you know, we have, we have um, classes and we have faculty meetings and we have our own creative work to do. We're showing in L.A. and New York and Berlin. Do you think you could just write a thesis on fanciful images from a female? <laughs> and I was like, oh, that would be so great. Thank you very much. Oh, I mean, I couldn't even type you know, let alone sort out all this stuff. I mean, my little fingers, uh, the, you know. It, uh, so that was the greatest gift. And I continued to work with Goethe's chromatic lessons up to the present, only 
it had become like riding a bike. I had no idea until I saw my retrospective that, oh, I had a system. Yeah. I mean, Greg put it together for me. Yeah. <laughs> and so I was like, oh, look, it wasn't just random, but it was hard to do because I didn't have a, a designated pathway. I always had to call things up from the unconscious. But I might be able to speed up now that you've helped me develop a language. Only I've made new discoveries, unfortunately. Well, that's or fortunately. That's part of what this is about, all the new discoveries of having this retrospective and seeing your work it's, across time in one extraordinary space. It's just for you. Yeah, I had no idea. So here we see Jean-Paul Perrinet's uh, artwork. I recently saw one of his paintings in, at MoMA. It wasn't this one. It was another one, very nicely done. Uh, a primitive artist of sorts, like Rousseau. Um, and I, the patterning was his, as was the figure on the, the lounging dais. And uh, I think the rest is mine. I'm not remembering correct, uh, precisely, as I haven't looked at his uh, painting in a long time. But anyway, uh, in this study of Goethe's, uh, I had a choice. I, I mean, I looked at hundreds of famous paintings, emotional paintings by artists, both male and female, making notes of the colors that they use for different emotional effects. And I decided that I could either do death and the killing of people like Manet, the, the soldiers lined up and the dead figures and uh, stigmata and eyeballs on a plate or, you know, all of that, or I could deal with the heart. And I liked the idea of the heart a lot better. I wasn't, uh, I liked uh, the eroticism of Indian art and Japanese art. It didn't bother me. And initially I started out with drawing uh, pictures for, of romance novels, uh, like the ones in the 40s or 50s. That was sort of <laughs> inspirational. Uh, Loose Lautrec was here, you know, and that kind of thing. But anyway, getting back to um, to this uh, and the uh, going into uh, sort of this primitivism and the rug on the floor was a, a Navajo rug and these are special people that shake the rattles and they're important people and I've forgotten the name of that but I included them it was a rug that belonged to my friends and then the patterning up above we saw in another piece and the espadrille are there in one that you'll see in the future. And then the black and white is a kind of patterning that we see in Goethe's uh, chromatic lessons. So I'm sort of bringing those in. And Ecker said, well, I think you should be in New York. I've never seen anything quite like this. And um, he wasn't on my thesis committee. And, but um, it was like, well, it did bring up things that people weren't using directly although there were many people aware of Goethe's ideas, like Turner. And when I walked into the Tate and saw lightning of the dark and darkening of the light, I just went, oh, he knows Goethe. And then I was like, oh, this is so exciting. I didn't know that I would recognize uh, the lessons by looking at artwork. And the same thing happened with Hilma off Klimt at uh, the Guggenheim. It was like, oh, Goethe's here. I walk in and, oh, he's here. And it was like, I did, it wasn't on uh, any of the tags until you get up higher. And it was like, oh, well, so it is something that one recognizes from experience uh, of uh, training the eye, or you know what, where it's coming from, what the root is. And so there were many people that were aware of what he had to share with painters. And that was what it was about. It was really lessons for painters. What I'm um, thinking about is just the streams in this conversation that have to do with you becoming a professional artist 
that, you know, part of it is uh, the beginnings of really exploring your history of trauma and loss, and also the decision to embrace love and authenticity rather than to continue to paint in the traditions you'd seen among male artists particularly that were more violent, which I could see made perfect sense given that you were trying to resolve your history of violence but avoid being exposed to it. Yes, the, the, the part that I would accept would be uh, tears, uh, that, because that was from the heart and it wasn't too aggressive. So I could accept that part. Mm -hmm. And then with this also, just the decorative motifs that, you, that are sort of a through line in your work, even when it's quite figurative and narrative, there are these little vestiges of different parts of the environment you grew up in or the art that you've been looking at, and that, that's a kind of leitmotif through your work. Right, and then just sort of with that underlayment of, of lessons that I had learned or studied, so I'm bringing those into play. But you don't have to know about those things in order to have your own personal response. Okay, so now we're going to come back to the direct work on, that you did about your mother's death. Yes, and this is the last one that will be graphic in this way, and you'll see the death of mother upstairs and uh, the Bluma piece. And this happened, uh, the initial uh, painting happened in 2015 when my daughter said, uh, you know, Mom, you still have the shadow in place, and um, it would be helpful if you could could get rid of more of that. And so I, I contacted my cousin who lived in Milan and um, asked her if perhaps she could get a hold of the police report, um, which she was able to do. And she sent it as a PDF file to me uh, from Milan. And I read it and wrote out the police report on the floor of this painting. Um, and uh, it revealed a lot of things that I was not aware of and uh, the kind of stalking and uh, abuse that uh, my mother had suffered over probably two years and that we had suffered as well. We had been trauma traumatized by uh, that because my mother was divorced and she was uh, working very hard on her own. And um, so... Uh, it brought up uh, a lot of uh, a lot of uh, emotional um, content, uh, learning more what she had gone through and um, and sustained and still trying to be a good mother and working full time and all of that sort of thing. So the sketch on the left happened before Bluma um, quite a uh, at least a year before, and so I, I thought, well, I need to get her off of uh, being dead there and at least have some indication of a spiritual life, and so that's a, a sketch of her uh, on a picnic table uh, in a, a park nearby uh, having a little picnic with me, and her name, uh, people called her Meg, and uh, then... On the right was Bluma, the blue ghost that uh, shortly after, either the same night or shortly after Greg and Amy Sawyer had invited me to have this retrospective, uh, she appeared in uh, the dream as a blue ghost and reached out and touched my hand and said, I'm so proud of you. And I really felt that as my mother being proud of me, as if she was alive. And so I thought, well, you better make that a painting so it's more real in your life, along with all these others that you've done that perhaps were not so promising. And so uh, I, I'm glad that I took that opportunity. But after going back and looking at the Pinocchio story from uh, the MoMA exhibit, I realized, oh, the Blue Fairy. Maybe that was where I. Maybe that was partly where the the idea for the blue ghost came in. You know, I don't. 
I don't know how far our unconscious reaches into the past, but that came up this morning and I thought, oh, well, she was the blue fairy for me, wasn't she, at that moment? I think you just created this title. Yes, just this morning. And I think for me, so I just had a chance to think about it now, looking at you as a child in shadow here and her as a young adult in outline, um, and you sitting here right now, that the death of mother and the mother wound is not just the child's loss, oh, but the loss of knowing Meg yes. as you grew older and to be the young adult peer that she could see you yeah. and recognize herself. Yeah. So I think that's just beautiful. Yes. Yes, she's always existed as an ideal, hasn't she? And uh, so that's quite a gift in itself. Mm -hmm. It's hard for me to see these as you're seeing them. I'm trying. <laughs> I'm looking at it here. Do you have any other thoughts that maybe we haven't considered? I think we can go on to the next, yeah. Okay. Give people a little break here. Yep. One of my favorites. <laughs> uh, last run in 1983, I had moved to Port Townsend to be with uh, friends that I'm still friends with, luckily, and uh, dear acquaintances. And um, so last run was um, on the rhododendron, and to get here, you had to take two ferries when I first moved here because uh, you had to go to Low Fall and you had to do the other one. So I was really going to the end of the earth, you know. <laughs> you had to either stay there or turn back. There was no further to go. I mean, you could go out to the total west end, which is also the end of the earth, but this was the end of the earth too, because the peninsula juts out there to the water. And, and so I did have that feeling like, uh, last run, I wasn't going to run anymore. This is, I'm at the end of the world, I'm gonna make it work one way or another. And um, I think you said, you thought it was just run. I did. <laughs> <laughs> and maybe I should have, I don't know. <laughs> but, made it work in some way because I have this retrospective. Right. You know, so that's good. But you see the mythic beast who appears in the book, and he's from antiquity. We know the power of the mythic beast. One way or another, you recognize him because he's in our souls somewhat. We know who that mythic beast is. And the mythic beast has his feet both in the water and in the atmosphere, mutable elements, and the bird uh, maybe the white raven in some sense, I hadn't thought of that as flying in between, caught in this place that implies danger of some sort. And the dog on, on deck is a reference to my Basenji, although I had forgotten that they don't have hair that long, but the curly tail in my companion dog, who has a shadow that's luminous rather than dark. And so I think I was looking for a luminous shadow rather than and to dispel the dark shadow. And this was my hope for a new beginning. And again, uh, being on the ferry was always, is always, if you're on a train or a ferry or an airplane, it's again that liminal space where different kinds of things happen, different things come to mind. But an interesting thing happened in that this is one and some of the others that I made a discovery because of it being in the exhibition. And that's something that I'll be investigating uh, in these months that are forward. I have some notes I wanna make and it's just a completely new uh, observation and, and I'm very excited about that. I'd like to hear about your trips on the rhododendron. I was on the rhododendron a lot. 
four days a week, um, eight months a year for 17 years. And so every time I saw this painting in Linda's house, I would sigh because that's a, an old friend, right? And it's a nostalgic boat, um, beautiful boat. And I, I think, um, you know, what I resonate with so much in what you're saying today is the liminal space of being on a ferry boat is a place of reverie, you know, that you're not in one role or the other role yet. And so you have this precious period of time to take in all that is changing around you um, and all the things that happen on the water and in the water all year round that I never would have seen, you know, the jellyfish in August, uh, you know, the whales popping up next to my car. I happened to look over and there was the baby whale everyone was trying to find and just was looking at me. <laughs> you know, so um, uh, I think it's a wonderful painting. And, and, and just to say that things happen on the ferry boat in that liminal space. Uh, people go out to the deck to say goodbye to images. I saw someone throw the picture of a woman overboard to say, good. this is where I can finally make that decision because I'm not in one place or another fixed place. So um, it is one of my favorites. Thank you. And I had another one that was on the ferry boat called Old Friends. And I did it for a bumper shoot. And they didn't even include it in the retrospective because they felt like I just didn't get the idea because it was just this lonely dog inside the the rhododendron ferry <laughs> looking down. And it was old friends. I was missing old friends. And I was thinking about, I get to get on the ferry and go to bumper shoot. But I didn't quite have it down how we're supposed to do posters until later. And, uh, and one of the persons who served on this, uh, the crew of uh, the rhododendron came to my studio and he said, well, those of us on the ferry cruise, we really loved that piece. And that, that chair on the left-hand side, it was broken. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes, this one. I love the poplars, and I just love the way they line our streets in Port Townsend, the pathways of coming into town and, and moving from North Beach down to the Boat Haven and around, they stand like sentinels once again, but they also are like my sable paintbrushes uh, reaching up and they also remind me of Van Gogh's cypress that move in the wind like the Mistral or Port Townsend was, has always historically been known as the windy place. Like, oh, you want to move to that windy place that makes you kind of crazy sometimes. It's just so windy. But I always loved the wind blowing the water so muscled up over Water Street. And to go out, it felt like it just blew away everything that you wanted to go somewhere else. So I always liked the wind. And, um, well, not that I wanted to be in it that much, but the movement and the gestural uh, aspect of that. Uh, but they were also like the flames back behind. And then the clouds in the sky uh, sort of repeated that shape, only taking on a more cigar-like shape, perhaps. But I just liked the composition of this and the implied uh, strength and power that was there. I hadn't seen this until the exhibit, or if I had, I didn't remember, but being able to look at it across the room, I found it stunning from an emotional standpoint. And uh, not a narrative like you need to, t to figure it out, but it just sort of hit me. And I think um, part of it is that uh, fire uh, is both alluring and exciting and something we get preoccupied with, but also terrifying in the background. Uh, and then these flames that are so huge of the poplars, I thought, you know, the combination of that, you know, was uh, arresting and, 
and also a kind of inducing reverie because of the contrast. And I think it's a really powerful piece in a very different way than some of the ones that we're going to look at and that we've looked at so far. Well, thank you. And the scale of it, and it's just really, really important in that way. Oh, yes. Now these, yellow bird, blue table, and the red table, uh, they speak to my love of uh, the Salish Sea and the gathering of clams and the spotted shrimp, and they're often shared uh, in neighborhoods uh, on a long table that's not unlike uh, New Orleans uh, fish fry or uh, the, uh, the shrimp that they get. And I, it just has a very communal feeling to me and the celebration of gardens and um, the color charts that are my notation to what I've done in previous uh, uh, pictures. But I didn't realize until this exhibition that these had the same color combinations uh, that were based on these chromatic lessons. I, I didn't realize that I was making this play between red and blue and uh, uh, the other things that seem to fit so perfectly in my idea, in my a configuration of what I felt uh, worked together very well. And uh, Frank Samuelson has a gorgeous red and blue combination of paintings that just bowled me over that's at the Jefferson Museum of Art in Port Towns. And I walked in and I thought, oh my gosh, you really understand this. I've got to get back to work. <laughs> it was so, it was just beautiful. And so I love these two together. I, I really, uh, this made it more clear that I did have a system in place. Mm -hmm. Oh, this is a little uh, blown out because of the light that we have here. But this is leaving the table. And um, if it, oh, it's upstairs, so you'll get a better idea of what, uh, what it really looks like. And again, this is a celebration of the bounty, uh, uh, the domesticity, having uh, great food, and but the the bird and the crow or the raven, they're kind of scavengers at the edge of things, gathering what they might, and so there's an element of uh, uh, a little tension there, and the shadow figure. There's some implied. Uh, um, mystery and the white raven is there and also this shallow space of a bird flying overhead that we don't see and this morning or yesterday when we were talking Lisa brought up well and the conch is there and I thought well I don't see the conch but I'm not what is she talking about and then it was this that sits on my desk and she says it's in all of your paintings you see and this was uh, a doorstop at my home uh, as a child. And it went missing. And so when I saw it in a, uh, a store, I just bought it because I had discovered that if I collected some of the things that had been in my home as a child, it sort of created neural pathways for me to remember other things. And so uh, I thought I'd bring this to just, yes, it does look like a conch, doesn't it? those napkins that appear in uh, several pieces, the whiteness of it. And, and what is that napkin? And uh, what does it do? It's both to maybe wipe your mouth, but wipe away tears. And then there's this memory of uh, this doorstop uh, from childhood. And we ate abundantly from the Columbia River, the sturgeon that Uncle Mays caught that when I was a youth, it was, uh, as tall as a, a, a grown-up man, uh, these uh, prehistoric, I mean, they scared you as a kid because they were so uh, remarkable. You knew they were from early times. Here we have the white raven, and little did I know that I had the white raven 50 years earlier. That was a new discovery. And um, I don't have this painting. It's in uh, Pennsylvania. But... Um, I was like, oh, look, the white raven's been around a long time. And here he is, the white raven with a rope around him. And that's a reference to Goya's time where 
to keep the magpie or a pet bird, you put a little twine and, and uh, kept them uh, uh, in your care that way. And then the pussy willow and the witch hazel were the early parts of spring in the, in the vase, and it was to cheer me. But really what I wanted was a flower that looked like a lobster claw. And I wasn't going to get that in the Northwest. <laughs> So there was sort of a disgruntled, you know, well, I'll, I'll paint it like this and it's great, but I've learned to appreciate it and love it by doing that. You know, it is what it is, and it's an indication <laughs> of spring. You know, why are you so demanding that it has to be this voluptuous red and yellow uh, lobster claw, you know? And so over here we see another variation on the death of mother where... Uh, now the cockatoo that's in another painting with Jean-Paul's woman, she entertained a number of people, a few people, and there are several variations. So the cockatoo, he left uh, Jean-Paul's woman and came into bed here, but he's in bed with a mask, and then there's another bird on the floor sort of pecking away at a few seeds. We see the espadrille that was in a painting on the wall is near the bed, and that same stool that was in the drawing of Shot in the Dark is in the lower left-hand corner. And the uh, checkerboard that was in the painting now is really the floor. And the heavy boulders, the bird tra moves away from the stone. It's as if he transforms it and makes it light. And then there's that drawing on the wall that was in the painting that was shot through, or the canvas that was shot through. That's a more complete sketch of that. And then, I don't know if I finished the painting or not, I was always remiss in getting all the domestic chores done. Here we have Letter to Frida. There were, um, in my studies, uh, I did a lot of studies of uh, women in art through the ages and made notes. And there were a number who really stood out uh, for me as instrumental in my developing my own personal iconography. And Frida Kahlo was definitely one of those. And at that time, uh, in 74, she wasn't uh, known as the iconic figure that she is now. She was known because she was Diego Rivera's wife, but she wasn't a figure like she is now. And then there was Leonora Carrington and other surrealists. But when I look at her work, it always speaks to some part of myself that I can recognize. And um, West Coast artists, uh, Faye Jones, uh, early small pieces that I saw that were so powerful. And I thought, oh, she... She's someone remarkable. And Joan Brown, uh, her paintings, I knew of her paintings before she did a workshop or a, a master's uh, class at Centrum years ago. And uh, so I asked her if I could just be part of this, but I was so enamored with her. I just wanted to make friends with her if I could and get to know her and do my work later. <laughs> <laughs> and she accepted that and wrote me a nice letter of recommendation that I still have. And she gave me a little elephant. And I gave her uh, a swimsuit so she could swim from Baby Beach around Point Wilson and back because she had swam to Alcatraz. And one of her paintings was... Joan Brown with the Alcatraz behind her where she almost drowned, you know. Mm. So this was a brave, remarkable woman. And those, they really inspired me to, I didn't have to be part of Impressionism or Post-Expressionism or Minimalism or Constructivism or any of the isms. I could tell my own story in an authentic way. And that was maybe the difference between uh, what goes on inside of us. Uh, I mean, it's fine to be part. I've been a school of, of uh, uh, 
a movement of movements as well. But as women in the second wave of feminism, we did give ourselves more permission to tell our story with authenticity and without uh, uh, the same, uh, with a different aesthetic, essentially. And so that's what I tried to do. And here, she's my sister. And the blood is, she had, oh, well, nurses come up and ask me questions. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I'm like astounded. Well, I don't know. I never thought of that. She's like, why, is she just going to keep bleeding over there? But uh, the elephant, people continue to give me elephants. And it turns out my dear favorite aunt of my sister had her room filled with elephants, elephant things. I knew nothing about that until her granddaughter sent me pictures. And so there was something about the elephant, and I think it was that the elephant remembers, mm -hmm. and we were not going to forget. And so the death of my mother was very traumatic for her, her dear sister. Mm -mm. Yeah. I think that... Um the symbolism of this is a feminist uh, statement as well about blood and women's blood and the anxiety about shedding blood on white, the sheets, you know, oh, yeah. menstruation for, you know, were you a virgin or not when you got married? And it's transformed into this transfusion of uh, artistic uh, energy and gumption uh, into a mantle that's cut, you know, cut work, which is typical of women's kind of lace work that you wear in this picture. And I think it's, and, and, and not worrying about the shedding of blood. She's got a firm clamp on it anyway. Well, not on the other side, though. That's what the nurse was asking me about. I didn't notice that. Now you tell me, and I'm going to worry. <laughs> she was like, don't you think you should take care of that? And I was like, oh. <laughs> Yeah. Well, there's the difference Perhaps. between symbolism and realism, right? <laughs> anyway, let's move on. This is uh, one of my favorite pieces also. Oh, yes. Yeah. So birds take flight into twilight. And I, w I started this in 2021 during COVID when it was uh, birds in the Valley of Love in Birdland. And there were 31 birds then, and in this one there's 21. So some of them decided to not make that journey. And what I discovered in the Valley of Love in Birdland is that, well, it was from the 12th century epic poem, Conference of the Birds, by uh, Farid Adin Attar. And um, it's well known, it's been celebrated by a number of very uh, fine artists. And it just struck me uh, because of the seven valleys, the, the journey. It's not unlike uh, going to the Wizard of Oz. And how many times did my daughter watch that? I mean, it, we thought it would never end. Of course, I liked <laughs> it too. But it's a similar kind of story, this journey. But in the Valley of Love of Birdland, I discovered that you don't really know what people love. Like the little yellow bird, he says, well, I just kind of like flitting around. But I see that the yellow bird is trying to make the journey. And then we see the kingfisher up here just above the white raven. And his wings are a little awkward, but he's trying very hard. And then the initial bird up above that was the very first watercolor I made in Monkey Shine. So here I have these birds from the early 70s down to the present here, and uh, the hoopoe that was initially in the story of the Conference of the Birds, and uh, the white raven interviewed each of these birds uh, to see if they would go on this journey to the celestial lake of spheres. And so, White Raven asked the Black Raven, uh, would you do this? And the Black Raven said, well, we do look for paths from anger to courage. 
And then the white raven asked the owl, Now will you go with me to the celestial lake of, of spheres? And the owl went, Danger is protection. And those were from dreams, and I had no idea what danger is protection meant until I went to get a new shoulder. <laughs> I saw all those, <laughs> that, that great team of people that were going to protect me from all these things that they were going to do there so I could paint once again. And so I worked from 2021 until August of 2023 on this composition. And in the early part, I could not paint with my right hand. So I could only work on a, a, a fine motor skills on the iPad. So I developed my composition on the iPad that then I was able to paint on this 40 by 60 painting. And, uh, and the backdrop is from uh, Dream at Salt Creek that uh, is also in the same space. And uh, I have a, a small chat book that's available that uh, speaks to uh, nine notes and visions of that particular, of, of paintings that I've done over time where that came from dreams or visions. And uh, I read some of those in the first talk that we had. And so here we have the birds flying to this unknown place of the celestial lake of spheres. And I have ideas about it that are in the works, but I don't quite have it figured out, but I put some words to it. The birds will no longer be confined by linear time, but exist in different spheres of the past, present, and future as morphic resonances, as a thematic focus for their destination, I will find a visual shifting of form, which is as yet undiscovered, but exists in some rough form in the realm of my imagination. And so that's kind of where I'm headed when I'm able to get back to painting once again. It's pretty exciting. I haven't done it in quite a while. So that, I think, unless you have any questions about this. That was beautiful, every bit of it. Thank you. Thank you.